Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our latest live chat brought to you in association with Scrivens on behalf of everybody at Warwickshire County Cricket Club. A very warm welcome, and uh, we hope you're keeping safe and well. We're through a cold snap, aren't we? Now, let's hope we can just start looking forward to the cricket season, of hopefully a full cricket season, and hopefully with spectators in the ground. I know how much the players, the Bears players, are loving the thought of playing in front of you again this summer. Tonight, our two uh, special guests are the two men charged with orchestrating the Bears on the uh, field for the next era. It's um, recently appointed head coach Mark Robinson, of course, and uh, director of cricket Paul Farbrace. We've got lots of questions. Thanks to all the members who have um, sent in questions. Much appreciated, as always. First of all, just to say hello to our two guests. Uh, Mark, first of all, um, Good evening. The, Bears, the Bears have had quite a few head coaches down the years, but you're the first one to have taken over in a pandemic, Mark. Uh, <laughs> how's it going? Uh, yeah, no, it's good. I uh, enjoyed it. Um, two and a half weeks in, just trying to get to know people and, and duck and dive around uh, the regulations that we all have to live around. And looking forward to getting to grips with some proper... Have you been able to actually see the guys much yet? I, I take it... No, I have a little bit, yeah. And it's always good to get on the shop floor. That's where you really start to get to know your players, don't you? Uh, and spend some time with them. And, and also not just the players, but the coaches too. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Paul, good evening to you. Uh, some some good news coming out at the moment, isn't there? Um, Jake Lintot has signed on. Ollie Heinen Dolby signed a new contract today. Newly appointed coach, relatively young and newly appointed captain. There's, there's a lot moving forward at Edgebaston right now. Absolutely, Brian. There is, yes. And, and good evening to everyone who's joined us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And, and rightly so. You know, we, we've said all along we're about winning. Um, and to win, we need. Um, the right balance in terms of squad. Um, we're not going away from our, our young players. That's still going to be our absolute aim to have a spine of homegrown players, which is really important to us as a club. And I know it will be to the members as well. But it's always nice when you can uh, extend some of our better performers. And I hope we'll, uh, we'll have a few more good news stories coming out over the next week, 10 days as well. Thanks, Paul. Well, we've got some wonderful questions, as always, from our, uh, our great members. Lots of uh, um, very interesting and wide-ranging questions. So let's get on with them. And it's, first of all, quite a few questions have, have been very similar along the same topic of overseas players. So I won't repeat all the questions. So if, if any member thinks that their question hasn't been asked, hopefully it will have been covered. Um, basically, we'll kick off with Adrian Meredith's question. And thank you, Adrian. And it's quite simple. How is the search for overseas players going? Uh, I realise money could be tight, but will we be having two in T20 this year? Well, well we took that one to Fab straight away, eh? So you can thanks, thanks, Robbo. That's very kind. I was hoping you were going to take that one up, but uh, that's how it's going to be, is it? Right. Um, no, the, um, look, the, the, the tough thing, and it is, it is a tough thing, at the moment, persuading players, certainly from Australia and New Zealand, to come to England um, and convince them that everything's going to be OK for them to come over and play cricket, for their families to come and live a near normal life in April, May, June is not an easy thing to do at the moment. Um, you know, we, we've spoken to a lot of players. We're very fortunate. We've got some very good contacts in and around all of the international teams, uh, not just Australia and New Zealand, but talking to all of the international coaches to find out what the schedules are, um, to make sure that we know when teams are going to be available. And obviously, as we've seen with England, you know, nothing is guaranteed, nothing is certain in terms of overseas tours. We've seen today that South Africa have announced they're going to come and play some games in Ireland, hopefully um, in July, some T20s and some one-day games. So at the moment, um, confirming overseas players is not easy. The one thing I would say is we're quite a long way down the route of finding somebody for the first eight of the first of the 10 championship games. So the way that the season pans out, we, we are pretty confident that we won't be too far away from announcing um, a player for that period. Um, as for the T20, um, I, I think the signing of Briggs um, last year and obviously Lintot this year would suggest that we're probably looking at one quality overseas for the T20. With those two, we feel that we've given ourselves a really good chance of giving Robbo and Rosie a very good bowling attack. So I think at this stage, one overseas for county championship, one for T20 and none for the RL50 
um, is our thinking. And the reason for none in the RL50 is it gives our younger players the opportunity to really learn and develop. And it's all very well us, and we'll probably come on to this later in the evening, it's all very well us developing and bringing through our young players. And we brought through um, six, potentially seven from the academy onto the professional staff. And we've seen that Mosley and Yates in particular have made a real great start to their careers. But we need to make sure we create opportunities for those young players and don't just keep signing players for the sake of it from overseas or from outside. So the simple answer, Brian, is that we're not far away from being able to do something and announce something with championship. We're working very hard in terms of international schedules and players for T20. Um, and as I say, we, we definitely won't have one for the RL50 at this stage. So uh, that, that's where we're at at the moment. Thanks uh, very much. That's a very full answer. I mean, just one thing that, I mean, Alan Plum has um, asked the question, um, assuming COVID restrictions allow, what type of overseas player will you be seeking? I think you have said on a previous chat that it's probably going to be a batsman for Red Bull. Yeah, absolutely. Look, what, one of the things was that, you know, Belly was obviously a, a, a big part of our plans going forward. The idea was to have, you know, that was the reason we signed... Tim Bresnan last year. We know that Brezzi, you know, has probably got, we had him for half of last season. We've got him for two more seasons. And the idea was to have Bresnan as a senior player with the bowlers and Bell as a senior player with the batters. And the absolute idea was what happened in Cardiff at the end of last season when Belly batted, uh, played brilliantly. But the opportunity for Dan Mosley in particular to bat with him in the middle, that's where, that's where they're worth their weight in absolute gold, your quality senior players. And, and you expect your senior players to score their runs and take their wickets, which, you know, unfortunately for Belly, he felt that it, it was just a step too far one more season. So our, our absolute plan is to replace Belly with a, a quality, experienced overseas player. And I hope um, that we'll be able to announce something quite exciting to, uh, to back that up. And in terms of T20, we're definitely looking for somebody to add a bit of power um, in our batting. Uh, we've said that all the way through. I think we we saw, again, you know, we saw some really great strides in T20 last year at, at various times. You know, Ho's opening the bat in the last lane, brain brilliantly. Mosley, obviously, again, took his opportunity, played fantastically well. Yates, when he came in, played really well. So, again, we, we've got we, we've got some very good players who I, I think are capable of getting us to, to finals day. Um, and I'm sure Robbo will come on to this when he chats about his early impressions. But, you then look at somebody like Hayne, who played the last 10 days of T20, played superbly well. Um, we know that Matt Lamb wasn't available because he's broken toe, but he's one who I think gives us a great chance in T20 as well. So we've just got to be careful, Brian, that we don't bring somebody in for the sake of it and block our, our players, block our young players' development. But equally, to win trophies and to develop our young players it's important that they have people that they can learn from, not only in the dressing room, but also on the field as well, and really have people that they can bat and bowl with in partnerships and actually learn from and develop their games. And that's why it's important that we not only get people of real quality on the field, but we get the right person with the right uh, personality and characteristics who will help not only grow those youngsters, but will give us that winning edge as well. Um, and that, that's one of the things, just before you go on to chat to Mark, that's one thing that has been really noticeable about Mark in the two and a half weeks that he's been with us, but in the previous conversations we've had. He's talked about when we win, not if we win. And I think that's something that our young players really need to hear more of, because that's something that, you know, it's all very well to, we all want to win, um, and we all want to win trophies, but it's really important when people... At the, at the in charge of the team are talking about when we win, not hopefully if we win, or it would be nice to compete, or we want to consolidate our position. Those sorts of cliches that get trotted out. So to hear your coach talking about when we win um, has been fantastic from my point of view. So, uh, and I'm sure the players will have responded really well to that. Thanks very much. Uh... Paul, um, one I think for you now, Mark, if that's okay, it's from Frank Craven. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, for getting in touch as always. Uh, he says, uh, Mark, this is the time uh, when pre-season preparations are really starting to crank up, of course. It is very different this year. How close to normal can the players' pre-season work be? And uh, is there any possibility of a pre-season trip anywhere? 
I doubt it. I doubt we will get away, which is a shame, because especially from my own selfish point of view, there's no better way to get to know players. Um, away from battle is always the best way, but we've given the players a bit of space this week, so they're, they're, they're having a bit of time away from the ground, and then it will, like you say, start to crank up when we go back on Monday. Uh, we've been working in very small groups, and we're going to go back into, hopefully, um, two groups, and obviously at some point we have to come together as just as, as one big squad um, with all the rest- and dodge around and do all the restrictions we can possibly to make, make sure that's safe. Um, the groundsman is already talking himself up to the groundsman of the year uh, because he's he's trying to accommodate as as good as get us out on grass March the fifteenth. Incredible when you think of the weather we've just been having. Uh, and, and again, that will be another shift because you obviously outside, you'll be able to get more people together, etc. So we're, we're going nicely. Um, he said he, the doors, and as, as Paul said, it's it's about just trying to get people to shift their attentions. Really, we've got a young squad, um, which is really exciting. And I was sat in Fabs' office the other day, and we counted. We probably got about sixteen players. I think they've got a legitimate chance to start the first game, which is brilliant for competition. Brilliant to keep the squad alive, um, but it's unusual. Normally, you you know, you know, you know, damn it, you, you, your first eleven, maybe there's one, you know, a couple of players just um, going for one spot. But we've got a lot of players. I think they've got a, a genuine chance of starting, which is going to need some managing, but it's also exciting. That is good to hear. Uh, you mentioned Gary Barwell, the groundsman there, Mark. He actually comes to the question here from Charles Ross. Thank you, Charles, for your questions, as always. Um, and he says, for Mark, I feel that one of the unsung heroes at Edgebaston uh, actually has long been Gary Barlow, who, uh, Barwell, who consistently produces excellent pitches for each format. Um, what sort of pitches would you like him to produce for championship cricket? Well, we're going out the era of um, cheats, where the wickets would have been a little bit more prepared to try and favour him. Um, we've got a strong seam attack on keep them all fit. You know, it's been a problem over the last couple of years, but we've got some good competition in the scene department. So we've got to make sure we, we can use that. But ultimately, we want to play on good wickets. Of course we do. Um, um, we, we, the biggest thing, we want our nicks to carry. That's all we really ask, is that when the batter pushes for the nicks, it, it carries to the, to the slips. But I've had a great chat already to ground, as I say, you couldn't have been more accommodating. And this comes with a really good reputation Um I know a couple of people from Knotts and Leicester who speak highly, highly of him as well. And he's just been really accommodating and trying to, you know, in terms of Portland Road, making that work as well. And, he, and we're going to have a little play with some of those pre-season just to try and see what we can do to try and get the best services to allow us to try and win. Thanks, Mark. Still with you. Question from uh, Peter Hyatt. Um, Mark, what do you see as your first priority to work on in improving team performance? Yeah, good, great question. He's trying to find himself a few seconds while he thinks about a good answer for that one. Um, well, I, there's always simple things. You're trying, to be, you're, you're trying to make sure you're a team. That's the first thing, a proper team. And you're trying to get to understand what, what is a proper team. And they might do already. I'm not taking... Not saying they don't, but I'm equally, I'm not going to take it for granted. But, um, you know, dressing rooms are like a family. And to make a family work is really hard because most families are quite dysfunctional. So that's really tough. So it's, again, you know, to, we've got to make them a, a team. A team that can be really honest with each other when they need to. That can really look after each other, which is going to be crucially important. Because, you know, we all go into battle. You know, it's on April the 8th we're going to battle. And we've got to make sure, we're, you know, we're ready... To, to fight for each other. Uh, and so we've got to start that with the first thing, is just trying to get us to be a team. Um, and we've got to practice competing against each other. And we've got to practice having each other's back when needed. Thanks, uh, Buck. We just um, a question here, probably for both of you, if that's okay. For, again, from Frank Craven. Uh, he says, um, and it touches on what you said a moment ago, Paul, about Mark expecting rather than hoping the team's going to win. Um, and Frank says, you've both got a track record of lifting trophies in 2020 cricket, particularly. Um, and the Bears, of course, would love to be at the finals day at their own home ground. Uh, uh, this must be a high priority for you. And you've both had successes with T20 sides. How easy is it to transplant that winning formula into a new set of players? 
It's not. I mean, I can only, I mean, I speak from my own point of view and Fab's will we'll, we'll speak about his England at time and Sri Lanka time. And, you know, and sometimes you hit the post. You know, I've lost, I've lost in finals days at Edgbaston as well as, as, as one there as well. Um, but you've, you've, you're trying to get, install a, a belief um, about standards, about what's required, about expectation. Um, and then you're trying to ideally put some players around, a lot of young players who help install that belief and that confidence and that know-how. Uh, and you, as I say, you build to it. And sometimes it takes a tad longer than you think. And sometimes you've got the right role, it can happen quite quickly. The incentive is there, isn't it? Um, you, you have uh, obviously been to final stay a few times and, and won there at Edge Baston, but to be uh, to lead the home side there, it, it, it was pretty special. It's a pretty special atmosphere, isn't it? And to have the Bears fans behind you, I think, would be would be quite exciting. Um, look, my first year, I remember my first year at Sussex. We, I think, we got knocked out in the quarterfinals. Second year, um, well, that's a good. Oh. Sorry, the first year we lost it. We lost to Edgbaston. We lost in the final stay. And the second year, I'm not when we got knocked out. It was the worst feeling ever. Because final stays is the most, one of the best days there is on the calendar. It's almost took over the old what it was like when I played to go to Lords. You know, it's a, one of the best days on the calendar, and it hurts when you're not there. And I think you need to get there to to really feel that hurt. And once you get used to winning and and, you know, and getting regularly to semi-finals and finals, it becomes part of your DNA. And when you're not doing it, it hurts. And you know, there's almost inquest, things like that, within the dressing room. And that's the most important thing. It's in, within the dressing room. And that's what you used to say. You're trying to build up to where the where the dressing room expects and manages itself, and the standards become really, really high. And there's almost a, a, an expectation on each other, you know, about what we're going to do and what we're going to achieve. Paul, you've um, said, I think, in a previous forum that T20 is a high priority this year and, and finals day the target, obviously. Absolutely. I, I think that the two, the two priorities for us are to get to finals day. And as Mark said, I, I, I was interested when Mark was talking then about he was with Sussex when they lost in 2007. I think they lost to Kent. I think we actually won in 2007, but that... Um, I might be wrong there, Mark. Um, it was. But the, um, the, the, there, there is nothing better than being at finals day, and and I, I think the two goals for Robbo and for Will Rhodes and the team are to get to finals day and to win the county championship, and they've got to be our goals. And as much as T Twenty cricket and being at finals day is fantastic, and having been there and won it, the T Twenty World Cup, I've been in three World Cup finals with teams um, and lost to one one. Um, and it, it's a brilliant thing to be involved with. It's a horrible thing not to be there. It's even worse to lose on finals day and be out of it. Um, but I, I think that's got to be our absolute goal: is not not to um, not to see how far we can go, but to be at finals day. And, I, and I've been the two years that I've been at the club. Um, the, the first year I was at finals day watching. The second year. I didn't go to finals day because I couldn't bear to watch other teams um, and I couldn't bear to be there watching it. Um, and I don't want to be there this year as a spectator watching it if we're not there. Um, and that's got to be our goal. And that's not putting Mark under huge pressure because he knows that, that this is about winning. We want to be winning trophies. We, want, we have three simple goals. We want to develop players to play for England. We want to develop our own players from the club to come through and play in the first team and not just four or five games, but a hundred games minimum, I think constitutes a player making the success of coming through the academy and their pathway and winning trophies. And, and they are our three goals. There's, there is no doubt. And that's what we, we will be judged on that. Um, and rightly so. And that, that's what we should be judged on. But the, the one thing that we won't be doing is taking County Championship lightly because winning the County Championship is the absolute test. And that's something we want to be, right up there challenging for and our goal this year is to be in that um top six um of the super september whatever else it's going to be called by the time we get to september but to be in that top six is our absolute goal because that's our only chance of winning the county championship so you know i, I like the the format for this year but equally as i say that the county championship to me is just as important as the t20 is 
Thanks, Paul. Um, Tony Coley has got on touch on the uh, the group chat. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, uh, just to remind everybody that this is live. So if a question arises um, in your mind that hasn't been covered, then do pop it on the group chat and we'll do our best to, to get it answered. Uh, Tony has uh, asked um, any thoughts about the potential use of Portland Road this season. And if I may, I'll just tie that one in with a question earlier uh, received from Peter Romin, who says that the website is currently showing all uh, Warwickshire's home games played at Edgebaston. Has it now been decided not to use Portland ground for any first team games this season? Well, I think our, our absolute desire is definitely to play at Portland Road uh, and to play some 50 over games. And, and as you know, last year it was our plan to play two games there. Um, it, it really is developing into an unbelievable facility. We're so lucky to have it. Um, members, obviously, I'm assuming, won't have seen the changes with the big net that's gone up um, that we had up for. Um, half a game we played up there in 2020. We played a, a we were supposed to play a double header against Staffordshire with the second team, which had a few first team players in. Um, we managed to play half a game and we got washed out. Now that there's a fantastic new picket fence has gone up. There's a great big high fence at the if you look out from the pavilion to the left hand side. Great big high fence to hopefully save the houses there from cricket balls being hit onto their roof and into their gardens. Ed Pollock who I've challenged to be the first one to get it over, um, came within about six foot of getting it over, which was a remarkable hit in that, uh, in that game. Um, and at the other end of the ground, there's about 200 seats have been put in on the concrete wall. Um, and the new net area is being developed as we speak. Uh, and it really will be a fantastic venue. I think the thing we've got to work out is, will it be ready? Will it be ready in time this year to host a game there? Um, but it is definitely... Um, in the plans to play some games there. And I, I think once it, once it's done and it's completed, you know, we're, we're going to have a practice ground, a second 11 ground that is as good as anything there is in world cricket. And I'm not just, you know, talking, I, I've been very fortunate to have been to a lot of um, academy grounds around the world. The Allen Border Field in Brisbane um, it is right up there. Um, they're very lucky. Lincoln University, just outside Christchurch in New Zealand is another great one the New Zealand board have. But when we have this, we, we really will have a fantastic venue and fantastic place for our players to develop and grow. And, and the great thing about Portland Road is that the pitch is of the highest quality. It really is. It's got pace and bounce and carry, and it's a proper surface. And very often when you play second team matches on outgrounds and club grounds, where they haven't quite got the pace and carry and bounce, you're not really finding out about your players. And I think that's the one thing we're very fortunate. When our players play up there, if they take runs and wickets, it's very well deserved. And therefore, it makes it much easier for us to judge them and to see how they're developing to get into the first 11. And that's why I was very confident, having watched Yates and Mosley play out there as often as I did in my first year, that I knew that they could cope with the extra pace and bounce of a hard first class, and in our case, a test match wicket. So... You know, it, it is a brilliant facility. So that's talking the facility up. The absolute definite of whether we will or we won't this year, I think will just depend on how we go in terms of everything being ready to play there. Because we, when the members go there, we, we really want them to be blown away with the facilities and to be excited by it, because it is something we should be very proud of as a club. Thanks, Paul. A question from Matt Grubb. Uh, not sure which of you want to take this one on. Uh, do we have enough depth in fast bowlers to compete on all three fronts, despite the likelihood of injuries, England call-ups and the hundred taking players away, or will more additions be made to mitigate against, against those possible problems? I, I don't think I've ever been so blessed to have so much depth in the, in the seam bowling department. Uh, obviously, you need to keep them fit, right? and you, there's no guarantees. You know, we, we, play, we play a sport, there is no guarantees. Um, but if we, you know, I'm sat here in, in uh, early February and I'm thinking, Crikey Moses, there is some talent in that bowling department. And one or two who, you know, like the young, the young lad on, who's just come from the academy, Manarach, Manarach is, he looks like a hell of a prospect. So I think we have got some depth. It's, look, we'll play a part, but yeah, we've got, we've got a chance if we can keep everybody fit. And it's, it's keeping the, the right people fit at the right times. As Fab said, we've... Uh, Lintoff and, and Briggs from a from a white ball point of view, you know that ticks a lot of boxes as well. And we've got some some 
land of the giants with some of our boulders as well. So we've we've got that potential for that pace and bounce that you need to to open up games when when you want to. The great thing from that, Brian, is that Robbo's not going to be knocking on my door then asking for any more budget for more bowlers. So uh, he's obviously quite content with the amount that he's got. So that's great news. But look, he's absolutely right. We, we have got a good group. And I know in 2019, we had a lot of injuries. But, you know, we, we need, we, we have worked very hard with the medical team, the medical team in particular. And this week has hit home for me. Ollie Stone playing in the test match. Ollie Stone has come a long way um, over the last 12, 18 months. And I know that people will be looking and saying, look, he's hardly played for us. You know, he's, he's played something like 38 first-class games, um, including one test match before this test match he played in. Um, but it, he, he really has worked exceptionally hard with our medical team. One of the things we identified in 2019 were that our bowlers were reasonably fit, from a point of view that they were gym fit, um, but actually they weren't robust enough to last four days of cricket and back it up. And that was something that with the coaching group and the medical team, we worked very hard on last winter um, to make sure the players were ready for this last summer 2020. And unfortunately, we didn't start until the 1st of August, but we're still very confident that the work that was done the previous winter and our bowlers have spent a lot more time on their feet. They bowled more overs than perhaps they had done in previous years. They spent a lot more time on their feet. Even their days off, they've been encouraged to run or walk. Um, and they, they've been encouraged when they could, when the courses were open, to get out and play some golf, because, again, it kept them on their feet. Um, and, our, and our practice schedule changed from four days in blocks rather than having a Wednesday off. So that was all done in the previous winter, and I, and I think we're showing signs that our bowlers are getting physically stronger and, and the key word being a bit more robust to get them through four days of cricket and then backing it up. Um, and, and it's all very well having the great plans for rotation, but you need to have your bowlers fit to be able to rotate in the first place. Um, and equally, we may have seen in this test match that with England that maybe rotation doesn't always work as well as you'd like it to. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm not an England selector, so that's, uh, that's <laughs> their issue. Get Frank Craven on the selection panel, I think. But uh, question for you, Mark, um, from Phil Booth. Um, he says, Mark, you've been part of uh, many trophy wins in your time in cricket, but uh, of course you were also a very accomplished central defender for Hull Grammar School. Do you, with hindsight, reflect upon the 1985 Hull Schools Cup final against Sydney Smith and think rather than drawing 2-2, you should have won the game? It was a thriller though, wasn't it? I just remember my long throws going in. I just needed somebody like Booby just to get on the end of one, but he kept hanging up, hanging back at the edge of the box, you see. So, no, great days. Uh, love my football. And uh, I tell you what, it's, it's interesting being being here as well compared to Sussex. There's some proper passionate football fans in our dressing room, which is, which is good. But uh, And Booby would be pleased to know I've managed to find another Hull City fan, which I never thought I'd ever go to a sporting club in the world and find another Hull City fan. So Will Rhodes has made my, made my decade, I think. Uh, you, were you offered a, a contract in football at any point, uh, Mark? Was... Uh, Barcelona were knocking at the door at yeah. one point, uh, Real Madrid, but no. <laughs> no, I played a bit of rep football, but no, cricket took over and and that it went in that direction. Still with you, uh, Mark, Michael Ratcliffe um, asks a very direct question. How high does red ball cricket rank in your list of priorities? I think Barb's has just sort of summed it up a, a few minutes ago, really. We want to... We, uh, red and white, it's irrelevant. No, we want to compete in everything. You know, we, the, There's a roman romantic connection to red ball cricket that we all have. Um, we, we were lucky enough to, to win some championships at Sussex. And, and as Fab said, it's a true test. Nothing is, gives you more satisfaction than a four-day win. Um, that you've, you know, you've, you've ground and you've been in the dirt for four days and you come out on the right side of it. So, and I think it's still with the players. I think it's still got that one format. It's like with the, if you hear players talking about test match cricket, it's that one format that gives everybody that deep satisfaction. Um T20 is like fast food, isn't it? It's like going to McDonald's. It's brilliant. It's instant. And it's sort of gone the next day a little bit. Well, the championships, like the, the, the fine wine that lasts seem to last forever. 
Susan Holden, thank you for your question. Susan asks, uh, what are the coaching staff's realistic expectations of how well the team will perform in all competitions in 2021? Uh, and is more success anticipated in white or red bull cricket? It's very difficult. I mean, I'll bid an answer. I'll know where, where, the, where the team is in terms of what we want to do and what needs to be done, probably halfway through the season. You, know, you never never really know where you are until you go into battle. Sometimes you have some great plans and everything looks rosy this time of the year. And then suddenly when teams and players are under pressure and different things get, um, different, different things could come apparent. But all I would say, we've got a hell of a lot of promise um, within this squad. Uh, it's, and it's, it's a new, it is, I mean, these are cliches. It's a new era, this. Um, the retirements of your, your, your Timmy Ambrose and Belly and Cheats last year. It's this, that's the end of the old guard, really. That's it now. And there's, that, that group's gone. And it's, this, this next time belongs to this, this new group, to, as you said at the beginning of the, of, the, of the forum, to a new captain. He's only 25. Our oldest batter's 25 which is so exciting. And at times we'll bump our heads. Um, my, my, my job as a coach, as I say, we've got to increase and raise the expectation. Um, we've got to create this, this feeling of inevitability about what's going to happen. And, it, and at some point we're going to win and we're going to win big. I'm going to keep winning. Um, but equally as a coach, I've got to get the players to understand how they manage that expectation. So, um, they've got to have it, but equally they've got to be able to manage it and it can't take over them as human beings. It's that ability to handle pressure, handle stress, um, handle themselves, handle their teammates, handle the media. It comes part of it. We, as professional sportsmen, we, our mistakes are very, very public. Um, people are always judging us. And that's our job as coaches, as much as it is to have the perfect for defensive. We've got to get the players to, to be able to manage themselves under pressure and under stress because once they can do that, they really are on the way to doing special things. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, a question from Brian Wild. Uh, he says, um, we have the fixtures for the first team this year. Will the second team have many matches this season and will spectators be allowed to watch them? Well, they've definitely got lots of fixtures. Um, we're back to where we were in 2019. Um, so we, we've got a lot of fixtures for our second team. We, we're very fortunate that, and I'm sure a lot of you on here um, made great contributions to the club in terms of supporting the club um, with, with your memberships. And, and that's, that's something that's, you know, we, we're very grateful for. But I think we're also very grateful that we've got a club and a, a vision at the club that we need to, we, we've got a group of 25 professional cricketers and we need to make sure that we're giving them every opportunity. And we're talking about winning. You know, the, the, the simple answer to the previous question that Mark talked brilliantly about is that, as I mentioned earlier, we want to be in that top division when the, the three groups get moved into how you finish in that first group of six. So we want to be in that top division. Um, we also we, we want to qualify for both knockout stages of both white ball tournaments. And, and there are realistic aims. We think they are realistic. In terms of second team, to, to do that, we need to put on a good group of second team fixtures. And Ian Westwood and Keith um, Cook have actually done a brilliant job over the last couple of weeks of, of nailing down fixtures against the best side. So we haven't just gone for um, local teams. We've, we've actually got some very good fixtures. I've already talked Portland Road up as you know, being a fantastic venue where we're going to play quite a few games this year. Um, but we've also got our, our fixtures um, work nicely. So there's a decent build up to the T20 period. So anybody out of the side can play some T20 ready for when they start. The same with the 50 over tournament. And then the same championship wise uh, beginning and end as well. So, you know, Mark's already mentioned there's about 16 or 17 players out of that 25 with our three England players that will genuinely feel they've got a great chance of starting the season. The, the interesting thing will be now that the one or two of them might be asking, I wonder if I, whether I'm in that 17 or 18 or not. Well, the simple way of finding out is work hard between now and the start of the season and give yourself the best chance of getting picked for that team. But So the, the club are supporting us to make sure that we have got the best second team programme going to give our players the best opportunity to be ready to play first team cricket. Um, and, and that's really, really important. I know a lot of clubs have looked at cutting back their second team fixtures, but 
you know, we, we can't afford to do that. And if we're serious about being the best in county cricket, and that's our goal, then we've got to make sure we provide not only the best facilities, but the best um, fixtures for our second team players to play. And I know that a lot of the members like going to watch um, the second team play. And that's why hopefully if Portland Road's up and running and hopefully by at least the middle of the season, it should be. There's 200 blue seats up there waiting for you to go and sit on and, uh, and enjoy some second team cricket and watch these young players develop. Thanks, Paul. Um, an interesting question here for Mark from uh, Carl Jordan. Thanks, Carl. Uh, and uh, he said, Mark, what's the main difference in coaching the men's game to the women's game? Uh, and do you think any of the women could ultimately play in county cricket or white ball cricket in men's cricket, i.e. Sophie Eccleston, who's been mentioned on a previous uh, forum? Um, in terms of females coming into the male game, like Eccles, Eccles is pure as a ball. She's got a beautiful action. She's tall. She makes it bounce. And she, which what makes a bit different for a lot of the female cricketers, she bowls at, at what we'd call a men's pace. You know, she can change from fifty to drop it down right down to forty-four, which is very unusual for male bowlers, uh, female bowlers. Um, the, the, the challenge all the time would be the bounce. It won't be so much the pace, it's the extra bounce that they're not getting used to. But who, who knows if you know, they were given enough time to be around the, the male game, people adapt, don't they? They always do. I'd question whether there's a need uh, at the moment. The girls' game is beginning to thrive in its own right, and, and there is some differences, and, it, and it's a great product in its own right. And the more it, it grows, the better it will get. So, um, I, I think those are those type of questions that we all sometimes talk about, but I don't, I don't think there's actually a, a need for it at the moment. Sarah Taylor was obviously as a pure keeper, was absolutely outstanding. She could easily play in, in, a, men, in a men's team. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were differences. Um, we had a lot more emotion, we had a few more tears, uh, which you had to get used to, to that, that side of it. Um, the girls would listen a bit more. Um, they'd actually listen to instruction, not just go off to do it before even half finish what you were trying to say. Um, yeah, there were just some subtle differences, really, more than general differences. But ultimately, it's 11 aside. It's, it's you know, it's, you've got to take more wickets than the opposition, score more runs. And it was your, your ability as a coach to understand your group of players and try and get the best out of them and coach them in the best way, which fitted their personalities and, and at times their gender as well. Thanks very much, Mark. A couple of questions on the live chat. Thank you to Courtney and Peter for sending them in. Um, Courtney Rowlands uh, asks, could Mark and Paul reflect on the performance of the Bears currently on tour with England, uh, both on their performance in Sri Lanka and in India? And have they heard from the lads at all? Well, Wokesy hasn't put a foot wrong out there, has he? What do you reckon about the guys? Um, oh. Yeah, look, I, I, I do speak to them all um, pretty much on a... A weekly basis in some cases um a little bit more often than that um and it's been let's start with Wokes. he's been really really tough at Wokes. he um is very similar to last winter in the he would have played in the first test match in south africa um but for illness and if you remember the team was struck down by illness in south africa that first test and england lost it and then came back and played brilliantly um, and it sort of it, it curtailed Wokes his winter. The same has happened this time round. He's unfortunately shared a, a van from Birmingham down to London with Moen. Uh, Moen's been struck down with COVID, and Wokes he had to miss the first uh, week, ten days of training, and that put him behind the eight ball in terms of selection. He, he was very, very close to playing um, in this last Test match. Um, he, he's he's due to stay there for at least one more test before he comes home. There's every chance he'll come home after the third test. Um, and then he, he won't go back for the one day series and, and go off to the IPL and play in that. Um, but it, it's, it's been a tough one for Wokesy. It, it really has. Um, I think Ollie Stone I mentioned earlier to see him playing in this test match. Absolutely fantastic. The fact that he's involved in, in that squad, he's got himself into that position. He's worked exceptionally hard. England are, Desperate to have him fit and raring to go in the Ashes next winter. They see him as a key strike bowler um, in, in that series. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it, you've just got to be careful that you don't keep looking too far ahead because you've got to keep winning the series that's in front of you. Um, and that's something that 
he's done well in this game. Um, not a great surface for him to bowl on, but I thought he's kept his pace up um, and he's kept running in hard, which is fantastic. Sibley, I, I think, Sib, and I've said this so many times, Sibley just keeps getting better and better. Now, I know he's had a tough game in this one, a little bit unlucky, you could say, in the first innings, but um, he's someone that New Zealand, everybody, since he started playing Test cricket, and, and he's a great example of the way that our media work. He got so many runs in 2019, the media got him selected um, for the winter. They kept on, this bloke keeps getting 100 after 100 after 100, he got to pick him. As soon as he got picked, everybody then tore his technique to shreds. Absolutely tore him to shreds. And, and he would tell you himself that he started listening to some of the nonsense being talked in New Zealand about his technique and the way that he batted. And he then went to South Africa, having come home for a short period and worked out that he couldn't listen to what people had to say. He, he, he could listen to people that he respected, former players on television or in the media, but he had to be really, really careful when and how he listened to that advice. And throughout South African series, he got better and better. And I think he's shown, um, again, on this winter, a lot of people talked about the fact that by the time the winter finished, he wouldn't be opening the batting for England. Well, again, he's learned through the Sri Lankan series into the Indian series. In the last game, his partnership with Joe Root helped England win that test match. So, you know, he hasn't got a technique that if you've got a 14-year-old kid, you say, I want you to copy that. It's not a pure technique, but it works for him. And the one great thing that he has, which all international cricketers need to have, is a fantastic mindset and a fantastic head on him. Because there's been a lot of players that have played international cricket. Graham Smith, Alistair Cook are two great examples whose techniques you wouldn't encourage anybody to copy. But the, the difference being, and we've all seen a lot of players, and you'll have all seen them, you'll have watched them play live. A lot of players that have played for England that have played five, six, seven, eight test matches, and they, they get left out and they never go back again. And the reason they don't go back again, or the reason they don't make a success, isn't because of their technique, isn't because of their fitness. It comes down to their mindset and being able to cope with everything that goes on around international cricket. And even with no crowds there, there's still two or three TV companies. There's still at least 20 to 25 former players out on the outfield before play every morning. And, and you'll have seen it at Edgebaston, for those of you who go to the test matches, you look out on the square, even radio are out there now. You know, even get the radio commentators out there looking at pitches. You know, you, you get all of the TV pundits out there, you get all the radio people out there. You know, the world and his wife are out there looking at the surface. They're watching players practice. The scrutiny that players are under is unbelievable. And that's why I think that Sibley has done so, so well, because people have ripped his technique to shreds. He's still scoring runs. He's keeping developing with every test match and every series that he plays. There'll be another couple of really good scores from him in this series. So I, I, I'm, you know, I'm really chuffed with the way that he's going. As I say, that, that's where I see the three of them. Um, Robbo might have different views, but you know, I think all three, it's great we've got three players out there. And again, it acts as a fantastic role model and, and a, a really exciting thing for our, our players to see. So, you know, the idea that we've got three players away playing, and it was only two years ago that Sibley was in our dressing room as a Warwickshire player, nowhere near playing for England. And so for Yates and Mosley and Hose and Hayne and others, Henry Brooks, all the lads that want to play for England, to see what he did, what Sibley did to get himself from county cricket to international cricket and how he goes about it and how strong mentally he is, is fantastic for them. And it's just a brilliant example of where, that's why Bresnan coming in, Briggs coming in. Briggs has been to seven finals days in T20. He's just been and played in the Big Bash and, and did exceptionally well in that. He got off to a slow start, but did really well for Adelaide in that. And we want players that are going off playing international cricket for the others to say, I want to do that. I want to be like him. I want to be an international cricketer and watch and copy. And in Wokes, you know, we, we've got the absolute consummate professional. He, he really is. And for all of our players to, to copy and watch and see how he goes about it. And we had that in Belly. You know, we, we were lucky before I came. We had that in Trot as well. You know, so it's really important for the players to have international cricketers going off on those tours because hopefully it gives them the incentive that they can do exactly the same. So I hope that answers the question, Courtney. It does, and uh, Mark, I'll just come to you for a thought or two, if that's okay. And also, of course, we've got the Bears bowling coach who's uh, coming out of quarantine in India tomorrow to join up as um, to, to 
assist the England bowlers for the next uh, six weeks. Yeah, Pop, Pop's over there now, so with that help, you can go in and give a bit of love and attention where needed. But I think I think what's exciting is the age and um, and Stoney, isn't it? The, the great ages in terms of, I mean, Stoney's a, a little bit older, but he hasn't played. So in some ways, the, the babies, but the, they're at the beginning of hopefully what is long a successful test, um, test careers. But they're both excited about coming back and playing as well. We they should have good availability for that first eight to ten games of the season as well, which is exciting. And as Fab said, you've got Wokes. He is just, you know, the best pro, the best person there ever is. I was lucky enough to do a line. Lions tour, and he's just, he's just perfect. And you, you could wish for a better senior player and a better role model to have around. Thank you, Mark. Uh, David Whittingham, uh, good evening to you, David. Uh, he says, How will you prepare the team for the possibility of another cricket season playing without spectators? I mean, let's hope against hope that that doesn't happen, but it, it may happen at the start. Who knows? Are there, is there anything you can do to get the players ready for that? I think the players are a little bit ahead of me, really, because they, they had that last season, so they'll be able to tell me what it was like. I think speaking to them, the, the, I think they found T20 the hardest. Um, you know, the, the bit more atmosphere um, and the hype that you get in, in a ground with the expectation that a big crowd in, in Edgbaston can give you. But, but all the players are desperate. Um, we just hope and pray like everybody else. That's sooner the better we can get the crowd back. But... We just do our jobs, don't we? That's what you do, and that's the you know, that's how you win. You, you say you, you go back to you, you have the expectation, but then you just go back to doing your jobs. You do your job as best you can on a daily basis, an hourly basis. Do what's right in front of you. And still with you, Mark. Apologies to Peter. I forgot to uh, pass on his question that he just put on the group chat, and it is to Mark. Which player, Bears player, I assume, are you most looking forward to seeing in action as his coach? Look, all of them really, as I said, I've been really impressed. I see the bowlers, it's like Land of the Giant. So all huge, um, which is really exciting. I mean, I'm excited in, for many different reasons. You know, Haney should be a jet. You know, my job as a coach is to make Haney a jet because he's he's got everything. And he's obviously done well in patches, 50 over cricket. Uh, finished the T20 as well last year, last year. Got his hundreds, but, you know, we've got to make him help him to really fulfil that whole potential that he's got. You've got the captain who's just got great presence, who's ever such a calm character, but he's got a good presence. And I'm really excited about working working alongside him and getting that partnership that's so crucial in any club. But I could go on. I could rack Liverpool's, Liverpool's and, and all the players. Briggsy, I signed him at Sussex and then I buggered off and went and joined the girls and I've had the pleasure of working with him. So... So I had a bit of luck here that far. We'd already signed him when, when I got here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to finally really um, coming to, come into a partnership with him. Great stuff. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Paul and Mark, you take a breather for one moment now because the question here, which I think ahead of media, Tom Rawlings is going to deal with, this from Paul Seaman, who says, uh, what will happen if there is no cricket? Well, let's let's not go there. Right? There, there will be some cricket. Let's, let's, be, let's be optimistic. But uh, Paul also says, will the streaming... Uh, the live streaming be improved so there is no delay if somebody turns on after the start of play. Tom? Yeah, good evening uh, to all the members and thanks for the question, uh, Paul. Um, firstly, just to, uh, to address that live streaming to confirm what we did uh, for the 2020 season, uh, which was played behind closed doors. So we, we uploaded the live stream of using an extra couple of cameras. So we had two square of the wicket as well as uh, one behind the bowler's arm at each end. Uh, and we had that sinks in with the BBC commentary for the Bob Willis Trophy. And then for T20, as well as those four static cameras, what we had was uh, an actual operated camera behind the bowler's arm at each end. Obviously, within T20, the ball is going around the park quite a lot quicker. So it was important that we were able to track those catches uh, in the deep, run outs, et cetera. So uh, we brought that and alongside it, we did the Bears Den TV where we had our, our host, Becky Wood, running a pre-game show with Brian and Tim Ambrose. Uh, we were able to uh, run an interval show and, and then at the end of game, uh, do something running alongside it with commentary from Adam Bridge. Uh, yes, we are going to be investing further in our live stream uh, for 2021, uh, regardless of, of whether people are able to get into the stadium bowl. Obviously, we're very, very hopeful and optimistic that we will have our members and supporters 
in the bowl watching this year. We're very optimistic of that, but we are in, investing in upgrading the live stream as well. So what that will look like, firstly, the quality of the picture will, will be improved. There's been a huge amount of work go over the winter with uh, the network, uh, which means that the cameras, uh, we do have 4K cameras, so the best resolution possible that we can have. Uh, those, uh, that quality of camera will be upgraded this year for, for all formats of the game in the, the Championship, One Day Cup uh, and T20. So that's the first thing. Uh, we are going to be uh, investing in a new software package of which I can't tell you too much about it yet, but you will be able to get uh, replays, instant replays of deliveries, wickets, etc. Uh, and those replays will be able to go out from multiple angles. So at the moment, we are able to put out replay clips on social media, uh, but we're only able to use those static cameras behind the bowler's arm. If there is a run out that looks good from the Eric Hollis stand or the Wyatt stand mid wicket, we'll be able to do that instantly now as well from multiple cameras. So the main things to tell you about the quality of the pitch is going to be improving. The quality of replays of the stream is going to be improving. And also Bears Den TV will be returning for T20 uh, with hopefully even more contributors than what we have this year. So I hope that answers the question for you, Paul. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, next question is for Paul. It's from Charles Ross. Um, and uh, he says, Paul, with the advent of the 100 and uh, the marginalisation of the four-day game to spring and late summer autumn, how do you go about as a club developing young spinners for the first-class game? I'm thinking primarily finger spinners. Um, how can they get enough overs under their belts to develop into county players and hopefully test players? Um, that's a very good question. I think that's something that, you know, we look around the country. We're, I think we're very short of high quality spinners, um, which is a great shame. And, you know, I think that there was a lot said when T20 cricket came in that it would ruin um, any chance of spinners coming through. Actually, it's gone the other way, hasn't it? The spinners have been the absolute um, the stars of the show in terms of T20. They probably won more competitions. They've slowed over rates. They've changed the the dynamics of games. And I think as a result, more spinners have got more confidence about bowling now at any stage of games. Um, but there's no getting away from it. We, we, we are the same as a lot of other clubs. You know, we don't have too many high quality spinners at the top end of our age group programme. Um, and I've mentioned Portland Road earlier. You know, it's important that our bowlers that, that do bowl, bowl on the best pitches, and pitches have a bit of bounce to enable them to get something out of it. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got four things as a spinner. You get the ball to drop. So you spin it hard out of your hand and you get the ball to drop. That helps. You're looking to get a bit of bounce. You're looking to get a bit of sideways movement. And obviously within that, um, spinning out of the hand as much as you can, you're trying to get a bit of flight and do people in the flight as well. So it's important that we, our, our best young spinners, learn to bowl on the best pitches. And at Portland Road where we play a lot of second team and obviously a lot of our um, age group cricket as well, they do get to bowl on those good pitches. But it's a long, it's a very, very long process to bring a young spinner through to first-class cricket. Um, and, and I don't have a magic answer to that. I wish I had. I wish I had something to say, yeah, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it. But it really is just a case of being patient and giving your spinners the best opportunity to grow and to develop we, we've got a guy working in our academy in Thurindu Pereira um, Sri Lankan who is working with all of our young academy spinners and he's doing a fantastic job his work isn't he, he's been with us now for two winters and he's not suddenly going to start developing high quality spinners I mean Danny Briggs is a, is a really good point in case you know we've signed him at 29 obviously to replace Jeets's experience you know his role in championship cricket, as much as it's going to be in the second innings on the good pitches where he playing at Edgebaston to come into his own and get wickets, his role in the first innings is also to take a bit of pressure off of our seamers and to be able to bowl first innings overs. Um, and I think that's been the difference in this test match in India. You know, Moeen never goes for two and over. He always goes at about four because he's an attacking bowler. Ashwin, with all his experience, is able to get a bit more control. Um, so you, you want to try and find that balance between spinners spinning the ball we don't want them to become slow medium bowlers we want them to become proper spinners and that's what I say it takes a long long time 
to develop spinners. And hopefully Thurindu can do a great job for us with the lads we have got in our academy programme. Thanks, Paul. There is a, actually a, a follow-up from uh, Charles, again, on the question of spin. He said, uh, with the signing of Lintot, we now have a left arm, an orthodox spinner in Lintot, and an orthodox finger spinners in Briggs and Thompson, but no leg spinner. Uh, are we overlooking an in-house solution in Brian Halford, who I understand is still waiting to hear back from Warwickshire regarding the trial he had with them in 1981? Yeah, and I think I've said this before, he'll be waiting a long time before he gets that letter back as well. So I wouldn't be hanging at the end of your drive for the postman, Brian. Um, the, 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 one, the one thing that we have got, and we've got this secret weapon, and I'll, I'll let you in on this little secret. We are developing a former SEMO, you'll have all seen bowls from SEAM, into a, a highly dangerous um, leg spinner. Um, the, this batsman on our staff has taken up leg spin over the course of the winter, and... Don't tell him this, but actually it looks quite promising. But there is a bit of work for him to be done. So um, that there is a leg spinner developing on our staff. And we're, we're quite quietly confident that he, he will come good. But it's going to take him a little bit of time. Um, so uh, and I'm not going to tell you who it is other than that he was a seamer um, who was turned into leg spin. So um, I, I hopefully you'll see him bowl at some point this summer. Well, that's intriguing because, of course, Ashley was a seamer originally, wasn't he? Or a swing bowler and uh, made that uh, step. Um, Brian McMullen has got in touch on the chat to ask, Mark, what are your play, uh, your memories as a player of your career at Edgebaston or your playing career at Edgebaston? Did you play much in Birmingham? A little bit. Um, drew a lot, I think, here. Um, lost the semi-final um, of the, would have been the Nat West, I think, here. We've got hammered, actually. Um, remember doing night watchman to Donald against Donald. That was a bit, bit terrifying. I had a sleepless night. I was not out overnight, obviously. Morning, I had a sleepless night. What a mistake! What a mistake! Should have oh, got out. Next, next morning, I got first ball to bloody pop well. Should have got what an anti climax. I've been gutted. So, no, my, I think one of my memories is a coach coming in, which I've said before. We can't, no matter how successful we were anywhere else in the country, we could not win here for a long, long time. Um, we thought there was all types of conspiracy theories going on about what they were doing to the wicket and everything. So um, I changed hotels, I banned support staff from coming. I tried everything to try and change our fortunes. And I think like back end of my time at Sussex, we, we finally won a, a championship game here and line. But look, it was always a tough place to come. And that's what I always, my memories, it, it was one of those where... You, you found it hard to put a white ship team down. You'd get on top and they'd keep bouncing and fighting back at you. And they'd always seem to have depth in the order. You know, there'd be somebody coming in at eight and nine and Barker or somebody like that coming and getting valuable runs and just taking you beyond your score. So that'd be something we, we're hoping to try and make sure we're still in, in this, this team that's going to take us forward. But, you know, that resilience when it's needed. Thanks, Mark. We're right on the edge of the um, the allotted hour, but just one more question uh, to you both, perhaps, if that's OK. It goes back to 2020, and it's from Dennis Griffin. Um, and he says, due to the start of the tournament, the T20 tournament clashing with Edgebaston Test, the Bears open with five away games in T20. Of course, this gives the chance to build momentum at home later on, but uh, it is a tough start. Yeah, it, look, on paper it is. Um, you never know, do you? I don't really get too wrapped up in those things. I think sometimes they're more headaches for the for the for the chief exec and, and the finance team when they start thinking about how best to get the takings and the crowds up. Look, as players, you you look at the fixtures and you and you, you plan how to deal with the game and how to win, um, whether it's home or away, really. So we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And Paul, I guess it will be, uh, I mean, if they can get on a roll towards the back end of the group, the edge Baston crowds hopefully will be in and big and the place will be rocking. Yeah, absolutely. But And that, that's the key, I think. You, you, it, with the T20, it's actually about peaking at the right time. And, you know, the first couple of games, you're, you're working out the way of playing, but very quickly you get into a, a rhythm of how you play T20 cricket. And that's the great thing about that competition is that, you know, as Mark says, I don't think you worry too much about where you play the game. Once you get into the game, it's about um, playing as well as you can do, um, get on a roll towards the end of the tournament. And obviously the fact that we've got a lot of games at home, hopefully with crowds in and with good support. And we do get good support for T20. Um, for those that can remember 
um, coming to games. We do get good support and, and hopefully that will continue and we'll play well uh, in this tournament. Well, thank you very much to you both and thanks very much to all the members as well for, for listening in and uh, sending in your questions. Just perhaps a final thought from you both as we look ahead to this season, which, I mean, we're all hoping it's going to be a full season with spectators, aren't we? And I'm just thinking, Mark, has ever seen, will any cricket season have ever been looked forward to more after what we've all been through in this last year? No, I think as soon as we get the go-ahead to get the crowds in, I think they're going to flock in. There's no chance of going on holidays that in the foreseeable. So going to sporting events and um, and lovely grounds like Edgbaston, it's going to be right top of everybody's agenda. I think just for me to finish, look, I, I look, I don't, I don't know all the players that well, but I do know what a winning team looks like. I know what good looks like. I know the roles and the ingredients that are needed to, you know, to, to get us to be successful. So that's what, you know, myself and the coach and the captain, we're working hard to try and make sure you know the right recipe we've got here and just to the members as well look i i love the game the badger of the game uh, and you'll see me around the ground i'm a bit of a superstitious coach so one minute i'll be watching from the hollies next minute i'll be behind the arm at the far end of the ground so please come and say hello i love talking cricket i love saying hello and as i say i know the members are the lifeblood of any 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 cricket club, any county club so really looking forward to meeting as many of you as i can Thanks, Mark. And, and Paul, just a, a thought from you. I mean, I, I think when that first uh, match starts with, in, with spectators in, it'll be a pretty special moment for everybody. Yes, it will be, Brian. I mean, we're, we're all looking forward to that, aren't we? I mean, it's, uh, you know, we want to support our teams, um, you know, and I, I know from, you know, Mark talks there about the, you know, the, the, the county supporters. We're very fortunate in, in English cricket that you, you, you meet a lot of people that you meet year on year that have been supporting their clubs. And that's, you know, the home teams, the away teams, you know, you know how much it means to them, but you know also know how um, you know, enthusiastic they are about their team. And there's nothing better than watching your team and your players from your team play and play well. And that's our job is to make sure that, you know, we, we get the team playing well, but um, we want people in, we want people watching the game. It, it is a, it's entertainment. It's a spectator sport. And we want people in as much as, you know, Mark mentioned earlier, the players sort of got used to it a bit last year. It was hard. It was really, really, I, I found it very strange. I mean, I'm a massive football fan and I, I'm finding it hard watching games on television. Uh, my wife might not agree, but I am finding it hard watching games on television with no crowds. It's just not the same. And, and, and last year, the, the games that we played um, w without spectators in was really, really difficult. And you do miss that. Where, you know, you wander around the ground, you bump into people and they chat and they tell you stories. I've had some great letters from members They've obviously been pleased when players and coaches have phoned them over this last 12 months of the lockdown, which has been great. But you can't beat having a conversation um, in the ground with people that have been watching their team for many, many years. Um, you know, and they'll have heard the likes of Robbo and I on conversations like this, talking about what we're going to do and how enthusiastic we are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's part and parcel of it. That, that's the great thing about sport, isn't it? You know, it's, it's about opinions. It's about ideas and thoughts. Who would bowl when? And, and you get that more when you're in the ground. The team that you should pick. Who should be bowling? Who should be batting when? And that's one of the great things that we all love about, I think, four-day championship cricket is sitting in, chatting to people that you regularly sit with, sharing your views and ideas, having a bit of a grumble about a selection or the way that certain people are playing. But that, that's what sport brings to us and I think we all miss that a great deal so the sooner we can all get back in and everyone be watching then uh, the better for everyone and uh, and thanks for thanks for coming on tonight uh, I hope we've answered all your questions that you had um, and as I say I think there will be some more good well I know there will be some more good news coming out over the next week 10 days in terms of players and, and hopefully uh, same with overseas as well but thanks for joining us tonight and look forward to seeing you all in person at some point during the summer so thank you thanks Brian Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks to you, Mark, and also to all the members for joining us. We've got a few nice thank yous on the live chat. That's really appreciated. And uh, Tony says it's good to keep in touch during the winter. That's what we intend to do. So please, uh, to all the members, to um, keep in touch with the, the club channels and we will do this again soon. Brilliant. For now, stay safe and take care. Thanks all. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.